I'm fascinated by musical works that really divide the crowds. And Robert Schumann's Second Symphony is a prime example of that. Some people love Schumann's symphonies. Other people are rather dismissive about them. There's an old idea that was around a lot when I was a boy that Schumann didn't really do symphonies. That he wasn't at his best in them. He was best in piano music and in songs and in chamber pieces. But gradually in our time, that's begun to shift. And the Schumann symphonies are played much more often in concert these days. And I'm very glad of it too, because they're marvelous pieces. But I said the second symphony particularly divided people. Well, that's the case. Some people think it's, well, it's been compared to Beethoven. One critic said it was as big as any of Beethoven's symphonies. Another described it as feeble, desperate, overworked, overwrought. All sorts of wonderful adjectives were piled on this symphony to complain about it. What on earth is going on here when intelligent musical people can look at the same work and one of them says it's marvellous, it's incredibly inventive. Another one says, no, it's not. It's really badly written and you can, well, I think there's an answer here because Schumann's second symphony was written at a time of real personal crisis. Schumann was a very unstable character, wildly imaginative, prone to alarming mood swings and as is probably well known, he died in an insane asylum at the age of just 56, having attempted to drown himself in the River Rhine. It's a terribly sad story. People have been arguing ever since about what it was that was wrong with Schumann's mentality, as it were. Was there a psychological problem? It's strongly suspected that he contracted syphilis at some stage. And that may have precipitated his final breakdown. But at the same time, there are all sorts of intriguing patterns about Schumann's mental health that, for those who know about it, strongly suggest the condition known as bipolar disorder. It ought to be used to be known as manic depression. Schumann fulfills so many categories from this. Sometimes he's absolutely pouring out ideas at such a rate you can hardly believe it, creating huge quantities of music, very fine music, in remarkably short spaces of time. Other times he's completely silent. And just before he started the Second Symphony, there was one of these. He'd had three or four very, very active years after marrying Clara Schumann, a marriage long thwarted by Clara's father, who really, really didn't want to see her, his incredibly talented daughter marry this unstable and disreputable man. In the middle of 1844, Schumann suddenly seems to have, well, it seems as though suddenly this great tide of inspiration stopped. He had a terrible nervous attack and plunged into a depression in which he couldn't write anything at all. Gradually, it seems, as 1844 turned into 1845, he began to force himself to work again. He completed his piano concerto, then he turned to the Second Symphony, which was his next big project. Um, he said afterwards, I don't like to think of this symphony because it reminds me of dark times. In other words, every time he heard it, it reminded him of the mental struggles he went through in order to pull himself out of that terrible depression. And maybe that's why this music divides the crowds, because there is something particularly obsessive about some of this symphony. In the first movement, for instance, you get this little figure, da -dum -da -da, ba -dum -ba -da, da -dum -da -da, da -dum -da -da, da -dum -da -da, which is repeated over and over again. It can be tremendously exciting. It's like almost like Schumann saying, I will pull myself out of this place. I will. But in an unsympathetic performance, it can seem, well, just obsessive and repetitive. So a lot depends on how it's done. And I do think Domingo tonight is the ideal conductor to bring out the essence of this and show us why it has to be what it is. At the heart of the symphony comes a wonderful but incredibly desolate, elegiac, sad, slow movement. And surely here Schumann is taking us as it were inside where he went in that terrible year of 1844, when it seemed his muse and his hope in life all seemed to desert him. Then comes a finale in which it seems he galvanizes himself, pulls himself together and strives towards the light. And there's one little figure I'd like to pull out for you here, which I'd like you to listen for. It emerges for the first time about three or four movement, three or four minutes into the finale. And it appears on the woodwind.
And as the movement progresses, you hear more and more of those until it finally sounds out like a great hymn on the full orchestra. This is a little quotation which Clara would have recognized because at one point in their long courtship when Clara's father wasn't allowing them to meet, the only thing he could communicate with her by was by sending her pieces of music. So he used to put little coded references in these songs, in these pieces, in the songs, the piano pieces he wrote for her, things he knew she'd know and would know therefore what he was thinking of, he was thinking of her. And that little figure is one of them. It comes from a song cycle by Beethoven called Andy Ferna Geliebte, to the distant beloved. So Clara would have immediately known what that meant. And the phrase that the woodwinds sing out that I've just picked out on the piano comes from the, the final song in which the singer intones the words, take, oh, take these songs I offer. So this is, this is Robert, as it were, again, addressing Clara and saying, thank you for standing by me all the way through this terrible crisis and helping me find my way out. And this is the song I offer to you in thanks to you and in love for all you've done. And it's that you can feel is what pulls this symphony finally out of the darkness into the light. As I said, this symphony isn't everybody's cup of tea, but it seems that resistance is fading and more and more people are beginning to tune into it and enjoy its remarkable message. Maybe partly because we are just much more tolerant of extreme mental states these days and less inclined to stigmatize people in the old conventional terms of mental illness. So we can maybe hear, yeah, well, obviously in art for a long time, in rock music and pop music, as much as in classical music, the idea of pathological emotions creating great music is something that we're all quite used to now. So maybe that's another reason why this symphony is beginning to shed its stigma and speak to people as what it is. A remarkable story of someone working their way creatively out of a terrible mental crisis. Okay, Schumann's story doesn't end happily in the end, but at this stage in his career, still there was a long way to go and he's plenty more good music to write. And in this work in particular, I think we can find and hear how he found the strength to get out of that dark place and set his creative work juices flowing again. Before that comes a beautiful piece by the Italian composer Martucci called La Canzone del Ricordi, the song of memory or the song of remembering. Now this is a very interesting work for an Italian composer to have written in the late 19th century. 1886 was the year where we think this piece was written. Um, now, why is that strange for an Italian composer? Vocal music seems to come very naturally to the Italians. The, the Italian language, after all, is probably the most melodic one in the European um, library of languages. Well, the thing is Italy. Italy's always been an opera-focused culture when it comes to music. Opera is absolutely at the center of it. And there wasn't much interest in music in other forms. Song cycles? Well, symphonies? No, Italian composers tended not to write those. They were operas, stage works, maybe ballets. But that was the center of the Italian experience. So Martucci writing something more introverted, more private, more confidential, more like chamber music, this was, this was a bit of a strange departure. And it isn't really until the 20th century that actually it's begun to come into its own. It is a gorgeous piece, incredibly tense, beautifully written for the soprano voice. But at the same time, it's definitely not opera music. This is music that speaks to us in a much more confidential way about very personal loves and losses, and about the sweetness and the pain of memory of things past, a sense of vanished past and the sense of the fragility and frailty and transience of life, all of that is beautifully worked into this lovely piece. The overture, the prelude to act one of Wagner's opera Lohengrin. Now, when you hear the name Wagner, do you think of massive orchestras, big sounds, opulence and richness? The prelude to Lohengrin is exquisite. It's mostly very quiet and ethereal, it rises to a grand climax in the middle, but turns eventually to the serene, luminous sounds of the opening. This is music associated in the opera with the image of the Holy Grail, which is central to the plot. 
And I think you'll agree when you listen to Wagner's soft, delicate sounds and the gorgeously expressive harmonies he creates, that Martucci, like a lot of Italian composers, must have been listening to this and paying close attention. So maybe there's a little bit of a memory of Lohengrin too in this music. <laughs> 